who is an adulterer. 5, 27 to 30, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, that everyone who looks on a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out, and throw it from you, for it is better for you that one of the parts of your body perish, than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off, and throw it from you, for it is better for you that one of the parts of your body perish, than for your whole body to go into hell. 5, 27-30, Jesus continues to unmask the self, righteous externalism typified by the scribes and Pharisees by showing that the only righteousness acceptable to God is purity of heart. Without that purity, the outward life makes no difference. God's divine evaluation takes place in the heart. He judges the source and origin of sin, not its manifestation or lack of manifestation. As a person thinks within himself, so he is, prov. 23, 7, and so he is judged by God, 1 Sam. 16, 7. Jesus' second illustration of heart righteousness has to do with adultery and sexual sin in general. In verses 27 to 30 he focuses on the deed of adultery, the desire behind it, and the deliverance from it. The deed you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. 5, 27, as with the one relating to the sin of murder, vv. 21 to 26, this illustration begins with a quotation of one of the Ten Commandments, x. 20, 14. In both of those cases, Jewish tradition was based on the Law of Moses, at least superficially. The Sixth Commandment protects the sanctity of life and the Seventh the sanctity of marriage. Those who rely on external righteousness break both of those commandments, because in their hearts they attack the sanctity of life and the sanctity of marriage, whether they do so outwardly or not. When they are angry or hate, they commit murder. When they lust sexually, they commit adultery. And when they do either of those things, they choose to despise God's law and God's name, cx. 20, 14, lef. 20, 10, deuterium. 5, 18. Anger and sexual lust are two of the most powerful influences on mankind. The person who gives them rain will soon find that he is more controlled than in control. Every person has experienced temptation to anger and to sexual sin, and every person has at some time and to some degree given in to those temptations. Because of that fact, every person is guilty before God of murder and of adultery. Although sexual temptations have been strong since man's fall, our day of permissiveness and perversion has brought an increase in those destructive influences that no society in history has had before, see 2 Tim. 3, 13. Ours is a day of unbridled indulgence in sexual passion. People propagate, promote, and exploit it through the most powerful and pervasive media ever known to man. It seems to be the almost uninterrupted theme of our society's entertainment. Even in academic and religious circles we see seminars, books, tapes, and programs of all sorts that promise to improve sexual knowledge, experience, freedom, and enjoyment. Mass media uses sex to sell its products and to glamorize its programs. Sex crimes are at all, time highs, while infidelity, divorce, and perversion are justified. Marriage, sexual fidelity, and moral purity are scorned, ridiculed, and laughed at. We are preoccupied with sex to a degree perhaps never before seen in a civilized culture. But the philosophy of sexual hedonism is not new to our day. It was common in New Testament times, and Paul faced it full force in Corinth. His comment food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, 1 cor. 6, 1 3a, expressed the common Greek notion that biological functions are just biological functions and have no moral significance. It was a belief many of the Corinthian believers had reverted to, or had never given up, in order to justify their sexual misconduct. Apparently they were arguing, as do many hedonists today, that sex is simply a biological act, no different morally from eating, drinking, or sleeping. 
But Paul strongly refutes that idea by going on to say, God will do away with both of them that is, food and the stomach. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body, v. 13b. The body is more than biological, as divine judgment will reveal. For Christians it is a member of Christ, a temple of the Holy Spirit, and belongs to the Lord rather than to us, w. 15, 19. It is therefore never to be used for any purpose that dishonors the God who made and indwells it. Christians should have but one response to sexual temptation running away from it, v. 18. The same philosophy that corrupted Corinth is today engulfing most of Western society in a sea of sexual excess and perversion. In its many forms, sexual license is destroying lives physically, morally, mentally, and spiritually. It is destroying marriages, families, and even whole communities. Throughout history some Christians have reacted to sexual temptations and sins in ways that are unbiblical. Seeing the great power of the sex drive and the great damage its unbridled expression can cause, they have sometimes concluded that sex itself is evil and should be completely condemned and avoided. Commonly referred to today as the Victorian view, that philosophy was prevalent long before the age of Queen Victoria. Origen, A.D. 185-254, one of the outstanding early church fathers, was so convicted of his own sinfulness by reading Matthew 5, 27-30 that he had himself castrated, the New International Dictionary of the Christian Church, ed. James D. Douglas New Edition, Grand Rapids, 1974,1978, p. 733. Peter Abelard, a 12th-century French theologian, had lived a godly life for many years. He fell in love with a young woman, Heloise, and caused her to become pregnant. To protect her and to try to rectify the wrong, he married her. Damaging rumors had begun to circulate, however, and, rather than harm Abelard's career still further, Heloise entered a convent. Her uncle, angry at all that had happened, hired men to break into Abelard's quarters and castrate him, Abelard then joined the monastery of St. Dennis, New International Dictionary of the Christian Church, p. 3. But geographical escapism, physical mutilation, or any form of forced celibacy violate God's purpose, see Hebrew 13, 4, and are just as unscriptural as sexual immorality. The Lord wants His people to be in the world but not of it, John 17, 15 to 18. And because our bodies belong to Christ and are temples of the Holy Spirit, they are not to be abused in any way. God created sex and gives it as a blessing to those who enjoy it within the bounds of marriage. Anyone who promotes abstinence from marriage on the basis that all sexual expression is evil is paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, see 1 Tim. 4, 1-3 Speaking of the marriage relationship, Paul commands, let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, and come together again lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control, 1 cor. 7, 3, 5 Sexual expression not only is a thrilling privilege but an obligation of marriage. In the middle of a biblical warning against adultery, husbands are instructed, let your fountain be blessed, and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breasts satisfy you at all times, be exhilarated always with her love, prov. 5, 18-19 the Song of Solomon is devoted to the beauty and wonder of marital love. God has designed and blessed sexual expression within marriage, and to malign or denigrate that proper expression by such practices as castration or forced celibacy is as much of a perversion as fornication, adultery, or homosexuality. The solution to sexual impurity cannot be external because the cause is not external. Job proclaimed, If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or I have lurked at my neighbor's doorway, may my wife grind for another, and let others kneel down over her. 
for that would be a lustful crime, moreover, it would be an iniquity punishable by judges, Job 31, 9-11. That ancient saint knew that physical infidelity is first of all a matter of the heart, and that lusting is just as sinful in God's eyes as the act of adultery. The Mosaic Law portrays adultery as one of the most despicable and heinous of sins, punishable by death, Lef. 20, 10, Deuterium. 22, 22. In strongly opposing adultery, Jewish tradition appeared to be entirely scriptural. When the scribes and Pharisees told Jesus that Moses commanded them to stone the woman caught in the act of adultery, they were correct, John 8, 4-5. Had not Jesus forgiven her of her sin she would have deserved stoning. Throughout the New Testament, prohibitions against sexual immorality are every bit as clear as those of the Old. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals will inherit the kingdom of God, 1 Cor. 6, 9, cf. Gal. 5, 19-21, Rev. 2, 22. Fornicators and adulterers God will judge, Hebrew. 13, 4. Regardless of how much a couple may care for each other and be deeply in love, sexual relations outside of marriage are forbidden. In every case, without exception, it is a heinous sin against God. In its most technical sense, committing adultery, from Moitia refers to sexual intercourse between a man and woman when one or both of them is married. In both the Old and New Testaments the word relates to sexual intercourse with anyone other than one's marriage partner. That Jesus here implies that the principle of sexual purity can be seen in a wider sense than adultery, though adultery is his point here, seems clear from the fact that both everyone and a woman are comprehensive terms that could also apply to the unmarried. The Desire but I say to you, that everyone who looks on a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. 5, 28, the pronoun I, e.g., is emphatic, indicating that Jesus puts his own word above the authority of revered rabbinic tradition. Looks, from Bleb, is a present participle and refers to the continuous process of looking. In this usage, the idea is not that of an incidental or involuntary glance but of intentional and repeated gazing. Prose to, to, used with the infinitive, epithemsi, lust for, indicates a goal or an action that follows in time the action of the looking. Jesus is therefore speaking of intentional looking with the purpose of lusting. He is speaking of the man who looks so that he may satisfy his evil desire. He is speaking of the man who goes to an X, rated movie who selects a television program known for its sexual orientation, who goes to a beach known for its scanty swimsuits, or who does any such thing with the expectation and desire of being sexually and sinfully titillated. Looking at a woman lustfully does not cause a man to commit adultery in his thoughts. He already has committed adultery in his heart. It is not lustful looking that causes the sin in the heart, but the sin in the heart that causes lustful looking. The lustful looking is but the expression of a heart that is already immoral and adulterous. The heart is the soil where the seeds of sin are embedded and begin to grow. Jesus is not speaking of unexpected and unavoidable exposure to sexual temptation. When a man happens to see a woman provocatively dressed, Satan will surely try to tempt that man with lustful thoughts. But there is no sin if the temptation is resisted and the gaze is turned elsewhere. It is continuing to look in order to satisfy lustful desires that Jesus condemns, because it evidences a vile, immoral heart. David was not at fault for seeing Bathsheba bathing. He could not have helped noticing her, because she was in plain view as he walked on the palace roof. His sin was in dwelling on the sight and in willingly succumbing to the temptation. He could have looked away and put the experience out of his mind. The fact that he had her brought to his chambers and committed adultery with her expressed the immoral desire that already existed in his heart, see 2 Sam. 11, 1 4. A popular proverb goes, sow a thought and reap an act. Sow an act and reap a habit. Sow a habit and reap a character. Sow a character and reap a destiny. 
That process perfectly illustrates Jesus' main thrust in this passage, no matter where it ends, sin always begins when an evil thought is sown in the mind and heart. Although Jesus here uses a man as the example, his condemnation of lustful thoughts as well as actions applies equally to women. Women are equally susceptible to lustful looking, and even to inciting men to lust. As Arthur Pink observes, if lustful looking is so grievous a sin, then those who dress and expose themselves with the desire to be looked at and lusted after are not less but perhaps more guilty. In this matter it is not only too often the case that men sin but women tempt them to do so. How great then must be the guilt of the great majority of modern misses who deliberately seek to arouse the sexual passions of young men. And how much greater still is the guilt of most of their mothers for allowing them to become lascivious temptresses. An exposition of the Sermon on the Mount Grand Rapids, Baker, 1974, p. 83, Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes, how then could I gaze at a virgin? If my step has turned from the way, or my heart followed my eyes, or if any spot has stuck to my hands, let me sow and another eat, and let my crops be uprooted, Job 31, 1, 7-8. Job knew that sin begins in the heart and that he was just as deserving of God's punishment for looking at a woman lustfully as for committing adultery with her. He therefore determined in advance to guard himself by making a pact with his eyes not to gaze at a woman who might tempt him. Just as the adulterous heart plans to expose itself to lust, satisfying situations, the godly heart plans to avoid them whenever possible and to flee from them when unavoidable. Just as the adulterous heart panders to itself in advance, so the godly heart protects itself in advance, praying with the psalmist, Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity, and revive me in thy ways. Establish thy word to thy servant, as that which produces reverence for thee. P.S. 119, 37 38. Paul exhorted Timothy to flee from youthful lusts and to cultivate a pure heart. 2 Tim. 2, 22. Like Job, therefore, we must make a covenant with our eyes and with every other part of our bodies, minds, and spirits to shun lust and pursue purity. The deliverance and if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out, and throw it from you, for it is better for you that one of the parts of your body perish, than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off, and throw it from you, for it is better for you that one of the parts of your body perish, than for your whole body to go into hell. 5, 29-30, here Jesus points the way to deliverance from heart sin. At first his advice seems incongruous with what he has just been saying. If the problem is in the heart, what good is plucking out an eye or cutting off a hand? If the right eye were lost, the left would continue to look lustfully, and if the right hand were cut off, the left would still remain to carry on sinful acts. Obviously Jesus is speaking figuratively of those things, physical or otherwise, that cause us to be tempted or make us more susceptible to temptation. In Jewish culture, the right eye and right hand represented a person's best and most precious faculties. The right eye represented one's best vision, and the right hand one's best skills. Jesus' point is that we should be willing to give up whatever is necessary, even the most cherished things we possess, if doing that will help protect us from evil. Nothing is so valuable as to be worth preserving at the expense of righteousness. This strong message is obviously not to be interpreted in a wooden, literal way so that the Lord appears to be advocating mutilation. Mutilation will not cleanse the heart. The intent of these words is simply to call for dramatic severing of the sinful impulses in us which push us to evil action, cf. Matt. 18, 8 9. Scandalese basically means to cause to fall, but in its substantive form, as here, makes stumble, it was often used of the bait stick that springs the trap when an animal touches it. Anything that morally or spiritually traps us, that causes us to fall into sin or to stay in sin, should be eliminated quickly and totally. For example, a married person's falling in love with someone besides his or her spouse is wrong. The relationship may be mutually enjoyable and considered to be rewarding, fulfilling, and beautiful. 
but it is totally sinful and should be immediately severed. What is a pure and truly beautiful relationship between marriage partners is morally ugly and repulsive to God when it is shared between a man and woman if either or both are married to someone else. The message of this hyperbolic statement of our Lord is clearly that sin must be dealt with radically. Paul said, I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly, after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified, 1 cor. 9, 27. If we do not consciously and purposefully control what is around us, where we go, what we do, what we watch and read, the company we keep, and the conversations we have, then those things will control us. And what we cannot control we should discard without hesitation. Obviously getting rid of harmful influences will not change a corrupt heart into a pure heart. Outward acts cannot produce inner benefits. But just as the outward act of adultery reflects a heart that is already adulterous, the outward act of forsaking whatever is harmful reflects a heart that hungers and thirsts for righteousness. That outward act is effective protection, because it comes from a heart that seeks to do God's will instead of its own. Like Origen, Saint Anthony sought to escape immorality and lust by separating himself from the rest of society. He became a hermit in the Egyptian desert, where he lived in poverty and deprivation for thirty, five years. Yet by his own testimony he was never freed in all that time from the cares and temptations he sought to escape. Because his heart was still in the world he could not escape the world, and he quickly discovered that Satan, the god of this world, had no difficulty finding him in the desert, William Barclay, the Gospel of Matthew, 2 vols. Philadelphia, Westminster, 1956, 1, 146-47. Jesus again sets forth the impossible standards of his kingdom righteousness. All people are murderers and adulterers. Many do not realize that they are because of the subtlety of sin and its blinding effect on the mind. Jesus does not suggest that the scribes and Pharisees, or anyone else, could deliver themselves from the propensity to sin. As always, the impossibility that he sets forth has a twofold purpose, to make men and women despair of their own righteousness and to seek his. The Lord's remedy for a wicked heart is a new heart, and his answer for our helplessness is his sufficiency. The story is told that during the Civil War a beautiful, highly educated, and popular young woman fell into prostitution. By the time she was twenty, two years old, she was friendless, broken, and lay dying in a hospital in Cincinnati. Just before she died on a cold winter day she wrote a poem lamenting her life. The poem was published in a newspaper the next day and soon drew the sympathetic attention of thousands across the country. The poem ended with the lines, Fainting, freezing, dying alone, too wicked for prayer, too weak for a moan to be heard in the streets of the crazy town gone mad in the joy of the snow coming down. To lie, and to die in my terrible woe, with a bed and a shroud of the beautiful snow. Some time later a verse was added by another pen. Helpless and frail as the trampled snow, sinner despair not, Christ stoopeth low to rescue the soul that is lost in its sin, and raise it to life and enjoyment again. Groaning, bleeding, dying for thee, the crucified hung, made a curse on the tree. His accents of mercy fall soft on thine ear. Is there mercy for me? Will he heed my prayer? O oh God! In the stream that for sinners doth flow, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. A. Nain Smith, 1200 Notes, Quotes, and Anecdotes Chicago, Moody, 1962, p. 184, Many men and women go to hell forever because of the deception of self, righteous religion. The illusion that sin is only an external issue is damning.